Step 4. Examples. So in this lesson, we have spent a lot of time deriving the forward Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform. Now it's nice to apply to some concrete examples. We're going to begin again with something very familiar and that can be performed very easily. We're going to start with the Dirac delta function. So what is the Fourier transform or Dirac delta function? Just to remind you, the Dirac delta function, delta t, is zero everywhere except for when the argument t is equal to zero. And there you've got a spike. And again, one of the properties of the Dirac delta function is that if you take an integral of Dirac delta function multiplied by any function, then that function picks up um, non-zero values only at uh, the place where the delta function is non-zero. So, when we write down our forward Fourier transform, uh, capital F of omega, as this integral from minus infinity to infinity over all time dt, uh, delta t, the Dirac delta function, times this exponential, then all the contributions are zero except for when t is equal to zero. So, when t is equal to zero, the Dirac delta function is non-zero and this exponential just becomes e to the power of zero, which is one. Therefore, the for forward Fourier transform of a Dirac delta function is a constant, it's just one. So it's flat everywhere. Is this surprising? Not really. Remember from when we were doing a Fourier series of periodic delta functions, what we saw was that all of the frequency components, all of the harmonics, not just the fundamental one, are equally important. They all had the same magnitude, meaning if you want to reconstruct a periodic delta function, then you need all, all of the frequency components, all of the multiples of uh, the fundamental frequency omega naught. Here we've got a non-periodic delta function, but still all of the continuous frequencies omega are equally important. Next, cosine function. So here I have written the cosine function in terms of exponentials just to be uh, just to make this integral a little bit easier to do. But again, it's the same thing. We saw that the cosine, um, cosine of omega naught t um, is, is, uh, is a function like that, given by this orange curve. And here I'm not assuming anything about the periodicity uh, of the function. And even though we could have just taken the uh, Fourier series because it's a periodic function, let's see how it works with the, with the uh, Fourier transform, the forward Fourier transform. So what we do is we can just multiply out, we can expand these parentheses over here, so we will have one exponential e to the i omega naught t times uh, e to the minus i uh, omega t, and we will have a similar one, but there will be an extra minus in front of this i omega naught t. And when, it, when we do the integrals of those, what we get is we get two delta functions. One delta function, is uh, located at position omega naught, and the other delta function is positioned at omega naught, uh, minus omega naught. And this is again what we saw from Fourier series. There we had two contributions to uh, our cosine function. One was at plus uh, one, when n uh, equal to plus one, and the other one was n equal to minus one. And this is very similar uh, in the case of the forward Fourier transform as well. So now let's look at something a little bit more complicated. Let's say that we've got a function given by this. This is called a double-sided exponential. So let's plot it first. We see that the function itself looks something like that. It's got a peak at t equal to zero, as we would expect. And then as you move away from t equals to zero, it just exponentially falls down. How quickly uh, it falls down uh, is given by this uh, coefficient n. And we are assuming that n is equal to zero just to have a nicely, uh, a nicely behaved function that doesn't diverge. So let's say that for uh, a is equal to half, we've got this, this following function. So now the question is, how do we take the Fourier, uh, forward Fourier transform? What we do, we just substitute it into our formula. But here I'm splitting the integral into two parts just to make it a little bit more manageable. So first we're going to integrate over the negative uh, uh, part of the integral, and then we're going to add it to the uh, integral over the positive time. So here we are expanding the forward Fourier transform capital F of omega as the integral from minus infinity to zero, 
of this exponential, e to the at, coming from our function, times the usual uh, complex exponential, and we are adding it to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the, this time, minus at, because here all the times, all the t's are positive, here they were negative, and again multiplying by the same uh, complex coefficient, e to the minus i omega t. And I'm not doing it here, but after a few steps of algebra, you can convince yourself on your own that you get the following expression, 2a divided by a squared plus omega squared. And what that looks is as follows. In the case when a is a half, we obtain the following spectrum. What this really tells us is that the frequencies, which are around uh, omega equals to zero, are a lot more important than the frequencies that are far away from uh, omega equal to zero. What's interesting is if we plot the same function but for a different a. Let's say that now a is equal to three, so it's higher. What we get from looking at this function is that now the function again has its peak at t equals to zero, but it falls down, uh, it goes to zero a lot more quickly, simply because a is larger uh, in this scenario. And when we compute the forward Fourier transform, what we get is a distribution, we get a spectrum that's a lot more broader. It's not just the frequencies that are uh, very close to omega equals to zero that are important, but it's also frequencies that are a little bit further away. And this is generally always the case. If you start with a function, with a time signal, or with a distribution that's more uh, broadly sp uh, spread, so it's spread over a uh, larger time, its uh, Fourier series will be very narrow. On the other hand, if you start with a time series that's, or a time signal that's very, very um, short in time, you will find that its Fourier, series, Fourier transform uh, is a lot more spread. What this means that if you want to uh, find the frequency components of a signal that's spread over a large time, you will find that there's only few uh, frequencies that are important to reconstruct that signal. However, if your signal is very bursty, it's uh, concentrated only in a very small time window, like this orange example over here, then its Fourier, frequency, Fourier transform is uh, a lot more broader, meaning that in order to reconstruct it, you have to consider um, a lot more frequencies, not just the frequencies around omega equals to zero. And this is known as the uncertainty principle, which we will see time and again uh, in quantum mechanics as well. But here, this example demonstrates that this happens also in classical signal processing. So we have been using this following asymmetric angular frequency representation. And in this representation, which uh, we can derive from starting with the Fourier series, uh, you've got the forward Fourier series, a forward Fourier transform as this. And then when you want to go back, the inverse Fourier transform is given by this following expression where you have this uh, uh, coefficient of 1 over 2 pi. And the, as, we, as we have shown, this works. But there are many other um, uh, notations that you can use. In particular, there is the symmetric version of what we have been using. And that has the following form. The integral is the same. Nothing really changes there. But it's just the coefficients in front of the integrals that have changed. And you can see that uh, where we had 1 over 2 pi in the inverse Fourier transform before, we have 1 over square root of 2 pi. And we have the same coefficient in front of the Inver uh, fo the forward Fourier transform. This is, this is a nice symmetric case, and some people like to work uh, uh, with this notation. Or you don't have to work with angular frequencies, you can work with ordinary frequencies, and in that case what you have to do is you have to substitute for omega uh, your uh, ordinary frequency nu. And we know that omega is the angular frequency is equal to 2 pi times nu, the ordinary frequency. So you can have the following expression. Now all of these expressions are correct. All of them will give you the right results. Just when you work with Fourier series, make sure you stick to uh, uh, one notation and you let other people know what notation you are using to prevent any confusion.